Welcome back to the 99, where we're focused on brewing a better competitive commander. I'm your host, Patrick Marlett, and this is the Oswald Fiddlebender deck tech. Yes, the same Oswald we tackled in a cold brew just last month, which I'll encourage you to check out if you haven't yet. But this is by far the most difficult list I've ever had to construct for a mono white artifact pod deck. Finding the clearest lines of play and obviously the best combos to play for was difficult and tedious with all the trial and error, but I'm happy to say that I think I put something together that is more than worth your time. But before I jump into the video today, guys, if you enjoy these deck techs, the weekly live streams and YouTube shorts, the Brew War segments, all of the above, the best way to help support the channel is with a pledge over on Patreon. And I have to say, our patrons are the best. Your support goes miles into helping the channel, and I thank you so much for your support. Also, guys, if you want to support the channel indirectly, the best way to do so is, of course, by purchasing your next packs, singles, and more over at TCG Player. Adventures in the Forgotten Realms hasn't been forgotten quite yet. If you're still looking to pick up singles, use the link in the description, and a small portion of those proceeds will go to help the channel, and I thank you for that. And as with every month, there is a monthly topic to discuss, and for the month of August, what got you into Magic the Gathering, and is it still the reason you play? Magic was something I got into way back in my teens, and it was a way for me and my brother to game together, spend time together. I actually grew up around a lot of comic book stores and gaming stores, and I played tabletop games, but uh, we did have one card game we played that's actually over in my shelf here called Titan the Arena, but we wanted to jump into something else, and Magic was what we gravitated towards. I think mostly because the art, but we always collected Pokemon growing up, and for some reason we wanted to jump into some TCG, and Magic was the right one. Tom doesn't play Magic anymore, but uh, I obviously do, and I'd love to know your thoughts in the comment section down below. What got you into Magic? And I've loved all of the responses from our Patreon community, and I cannot wait to share the thoughts of one of our brew crew and our masters at the end of this video. But without further ado, I think it's time to talk about Oswald Fiddlebender, and this is such an interesting legendary. I'm glad we got at least one from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, but Oswald is one generic, one white for a legendary creature gnome artificer, and he has the incredible ability called Magical Tinkering. Uh, Two-two body, I should mention. For one white, tap, sacrifice an artifact, search your library for an artifact card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrifice artifact's mana value, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle. Activate only as a sorcery. Now, you might have heard me refer to this as a pod deck. Uh, traditionally speaking, there is a card called Birthing Pod that has much the same ability, except it converts creatures into slightly bigger creatures. And generally speaking, people don't play Birthing Pod for value. You're usually trying to incorporate it in a line of play that will win on the spot, utilizing a variety of creatures. Usually there's a Felidar gar uh, Guardian in there, and you'll win on the spot, provided you have X amount of mana. But in this instance, our play lines are radically different. We are podding for value, and we're trying to set up a plays for ourselves. Now, there are a variety of combos you can actually play for in Mono White, believe it or not, <laughs> but I've narrowed it down to four separate combo lines. And of course, I'm going to help you through all of them in this guide today, but it's important to note just a handful of things before we get into this. Your starting hand for this deck wants to have Oswald down turn one, every game. Whether you mulligan down to six or mulligan down to five, you need to make sure that you have them down turn one so you can dictate how the game plays out from turn two onwards. That's all there is to the starting hand. Also note, you want a handful of artifacts, and more than 50% of this list is artifact based, so you're going to have a pretty easy time finding an artifact for Oswald to crack. Now, please note, if you're operating on a budget, and you need to opt out some of these more expensive fast mana pieces like the Chrome Mox, the Mox Diamond, the Mana Crypt. Make sure that you still have impactful plays on turn one as you mulligan. Whether that means, you know, finding your soul ring and playing out a damping sphere uh, and or having a deafening silence in this list instead so that you are able to impact how the game is played from turn one and run a slightly slower list because of the lack of fast mana. And in this instance, you know, playing two lands, playing Oswald turn two, that's a-okay. But our mana positive rocks are very important to this list, so if you can't afford them and your playgroup's okay with it, just go ahead and proxy the Grim Monolith, you know, proxy the Mana Vault. Uh, you'll see that they are integral to some of these play lines, at least with how I've structured this pod list. 
And how you play this deck is going to vary depending on the actual pod you're sitting in. If there's three proactive players, you can play like this as a mid-range stacks list as it's intended, or you can also play very greedily and win on turn two, win on turn three, power through those pod phases and those combo lines, which we're actually going to start this deck tech with. So our first combo is Basalt Monolith and Rings of Bright Hearth. And Basalt Monolith reads three generic artifact. Basalt Monolith doesn't untap during your untap step. That's okay. Tap for three. <laughs> generic mana, pay three, untap Basalt Monolith. And when you pair that with Rings of Bright Hearth for three generic artifact, whenever you activate an ability, if it isn't a mana ability, you may pay two. If you do, copy that ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. You'll need two generic in excess of what Basalt Monolith is tapping for to begin this combo line, but once you tap Basalt Monolith, you'll add three mana. Promptly spend that three to untap Basalt Monolith. Oh, there's a trigger on Rings of Bright Hearth, pay the additional two. You've spent five mana, but in this instance, you'll untap it the once, tap it again for three generic. Then you'll untap it for the original untap activated ability and tap it once more, you'll find that you have six mana in your mana pool. Now, six is one more than five. If you do the same combo again, you'll find that you're up, up at least two mana and you'll continuously go up generic. Now, with this, it's just infinite generic mana, right? You still do need an outlet, and we have a handful of outlets in this list. Staff of Domination is a good one. Staff of Domination allows it to uh, untap itself and also just draw through the deck. Um, it's three generic. I won't read over all the effects. You've likely seen this card before, but it's on the screen. You'll pay one to untap it and five to draw a card. So draw through the list. If you happen to have Walking Ballista, in your hand, you can pour infinite generic mana into Walking Ballista and damage out the board. Or in much the same fashion that you're drawing the deck with Staff of Domination, you'll also be able to use Sensei's Divining Top for one generic to draw through the deck. Now this one's a little tricky, but it's also going to utilize Rings of Bright Hearth uh, in somewhat similar fashion as we used with Basalt. So when you tap it, you get to draw a card and place Sensei's Divining Top on top of your deck. Well, if you tap it, to put that ability on the stack, you can pay two generic to then <laughs> draw an additional card. You'll fail to put Sensei's Divining Top on top of your deck because you'll have placed it there with that secondary activation, but you'll draw a card and draw Sensei's Divining Top. So you're drawing two cards, one being Sensei's, one being anything else from your deck, and you'll draw through the list. It sounds kooky, but it works. Trust me. You can look it up. but. Uh, just because you failed to do the senseis on top doesn't mean the ability is at fault. Now, on that note, Sensei's Divining Top. It's also part of another combo in this deck, and it's actually a combo that I'm going to encourage you to steer away from, as it's one of the more difficult ones to set up, and we'll discuss why that is when we get into the play lines later. But Sensei's Divining Top will work in tandem with Cloud Key and Mystic Forge. So Cloud Key for three generic artifacts. As Cloud Key enters the battlefield, choose artifact, creature, enchantment, instant, or sorcery. Spells you cast of chosen type cost one less to cast. And Mystic Forge reads for four generic artifacts. You may look at the top card of your library anytime. You may cast the top card of your library if it's an artifact card or a colorless non-land card. You can also tap it, pay a life, exile the top card of your library. It's just a good way to dig through your list. These are generally just good value pieces for the deck, but if you happen to have Sensei's Divining Top, you can tap it, draw a card, and lo and behold, Mystic Forge allows me to play the top card of my deck. Well, that's Sensei's Divining Top in this instance. And Cloud Key means it's zero mana to cast. Doesn't matter whether it's from my hand and exile on top of my deck, it's zero mana to cast. So I can use Sensei's Divining Top to continuously draw through my deck. Again, not the combo line I normally shoot for, but it does exist in the list and it works off of two really good value cards. The next combo I want to illustrate is a combo I'll recommend you shoot for. Beyond the Basalt Rings line, this is an excellent line of play, and it's a Persist line. This is rare to say in a CDH setting that you get to shoot for Persist, but it works very well in this deck. And it's utilizing Lesser Mastercore, Metallic Mimic, and a little known card, 
called Blasting Station. Now, to start, I'll read off Lesser Masticore. It is too generic. Artifact, Creature, Masticore. As an additional cost to cast the spell, discard a card. Generally speaking, we're not trying to cast this, but if it's in your hand and you're able to set this up, you will cast this. Just make sure you have something to discard. You pay four, Lesser Masticore deals one damage to target creature. Generally speaking, you're not gonna care about this ability. You're really into Lesser Masticore for its persist keyword. When this creature dies, if it had no negative one, negative one counters on it, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a negative one, negative one counter on it. For two generic artifact creature shapeshifter, as metallic mimic enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. You will say Masticore. There is an excuse to say construct, but you will say Masticore 99% of the time. Metallic Mimic is the chosen type in addition to its other types. What a great tribal Masticore. Each other creature you control of the chosen type enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter on it. In concerns to plus one counters and negative one counters, they will pile on the card until one overrides the other. So if you have five negative one counters on a creature and only two plus one counters, it will have three negative one counters. But in the instance of Metallic Mimic and Lesser Masticore, if you have one negative one negative one counter on a creature and one plus one plus one counter on a creature, it will negate or override the counters and Masticore will just be that. A lowly 2-2 Masticore with Persist. And of course, you'll finish off the table with Blasting Station. If you like my Teshar list, you likely know this card. It's three generic artifacts, sacrifice a creature, Blasting Station deals one damage to target creature or player, just a little bit better than Masticore. And whenever a creature comes into play, with Persist perhaps, you may untap Blasting Station. So again, this is a nice combo to play for because you'll notice Masticore, Metallic Mimic, they're both two drops. They're both very accessible and easy to get. Uh, with a tap on the fiddle bender, but Blasting Station plays really well into this combo because if you have the Metallic Mimic and you have the Masticore, you can fiddle bend that Masticore to get our Blasting Station on the battlefield and set up this three card combo. Obviously, the Persister will come back. You'll have an untapped trigger from Blasting Station. You can let it resolve or you can respond to it by tapping Blasting Station to start damaging off the board. Really good combo uh, and one of my favorites for the deck. It's not one I initially went for, but it works extremely, extremely well. Now, the last combo I want to illustrate is a soft lock. This isn't something I generally do in CDH, but it's actually very accessible and very easy to do in this deck. And it utilizes one of my favorite stacks pieces, Dranith Magistrate and Uba Mask. Drenith reads for one generic, one white, creature human wizard, one three body, your opponents can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands. And Uba Mask for a four generic artifact, if a player would draw a card, that player exiles that card face up instead. This includes the first card you draw each turn. Each player may play lands and cast spells from among cards they exiled with Uba Mask this turn. Otherwise, Uba Mask just says it's exiled and I'm sorry. But you'll notice if Drenith and Uba Mask both happen to be down, well, no one gets to play anything other than you. That's really good. Now this is a soft lock because your opponents may have in their hands a means of removal or a means of bounce for either Dranith and or Uba Mask. But if they don't, or they're otherwise unable to play said spells because you've laid down a Trini Sphere a turn prior, they're in a very bad state. They are not a good position because from the rest of the game on, you'll be the only one doing anything and you can take your sweet time setting up whatever combo line you want. But this is very easy to settle into. Despite us being in white, not having a decent tutor for the Dranith Magistrate, we do have one tutor and that is part of a play line I will illustrate later in this video. But those are the four combos that I've included in this list and there are more. You could play for Metal Worker, but I found that Metal Worker is very situationally dependent and doesn't always combo out neatly with our Staff of Domination, despite that being a 1-2 combo, an A plus B combo. I find that these four work best. And having four combos in one deck is more than enough, I think, in regards to CDH deck. Now, before I jump into the play lines, it's important to note that this card, Oswald Fiddlebender, is not quite like Birthing Pod. There are more accessible lines of play with Birthing Pod that exist uh, outright over the Fiddlebender. You know, again, this pod being in mono white also limits it, but 
there aren't that many artifact based combos that we can reliably get out with just Fiddlebender and no other cards on the battlefield. So I want to illustrate uh, or rather go over two doublers, things that are going to allow us to Fiddlebend twice a turn, but illustrate combos that utilize uh, just Fiddlebender or Fiddlebender with a doubler. And what are doublers? They happen to be Illusionist Bracers and the card I just previously mentioned, Rings of Bright Hearth. These two cards are core, integral to the stack. Now, you know what rings does, but Illusionist Bracers, if you pay two, you get an artifact equipment. Whenever an ability of equipped creature is activated, if it isn't a mana ability, copy that ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. It's three to equip. Well, cards like this are really good because instead of converting one artifact into just another artifact, you can convert that one drop into two two drops or that two drop into three three drops pending the cost is met. The equipment for Illusionist Bracers and or the two generic on our Rings of Bright Hearth. But what's nice is that with a commander that finds any artifact from our list at any time, you can be very deliberate about your setup. You can convert your Soul Ring very easily into an Illusionist Bracer setup with Fiddlebender. It's very easy to play for these. I highly recommend you shoot for these, particularly if you're playing proactively with the deck, because these doublers are an excellent way to set up our combos. Now, one more thing I want to talk about before I jump into these play lines. You're going to notice a trend with all of these play lines. So instead of naming these cards off as we go over the combos, I just want to get them out of the way now. And those two cards, the most second most important cards for the list, are Mage Rite Stone and Thousand Year Elixir. So for two generic artifacts, pay one, untapped target creature that has an activated ability in its cost. And very similarly, we have Thousand Year Elixir. For three generic artifacts, you may activate abilities of creatures you control as though those creatures had haste. This is really good with Oswald, but you also can pay one, tap it, untap target creature. These cards are absolutely integral to the list and you can see how well they work in tandem with our doublers, being Illusionist Bracers and Rings of Bright Hearth, because when you can untap that creature and convert another other artifact into two more, well, we're slamming down a lot of combo pieces, stacks pieces, fast mana, anything we want in a moment's notice. And for little to no mana, it's one generic and one white to accomplish this task. It's absolutely nutty. In the case of Rings of Bright Hearth, you pay two generic, but that's okay. That's okay. I don't mind. We could just drop a Grim Monolith and whatever else we wanted, and then we have all the generic we want, right? Now, because these cards are so integral, I want to illustrate a handful of play lines with and without doublers, all right? Every single combo, practically every single combo, is going to rely on untappers to get the job done, but the doublers enhance our pod lines. So to get to the Rings of Bright Hearth and Basalt Monolith play. With a doubler on the battlefield, and in this instance we'll say Rings of Bright Hearth, you'll need at least one 1 CMC artifact, three white mana, and four generic mana. We'll fiddle bend the 1 CMC artifact to get Mage Rite Stone and Grim Monolith. We'll tap Grim Monolith now for three generic mana to not only pay for Mage Rite Stone, but to also pay for the triggered ability on Rings of Bright Hearth to double yet again Oswald's ability. And in this instance, we can break Grim Monolith and or any other 2CMC rock, but we'll go for Basalt Monolith and Thousand Year Elixir. Now, provided we have, again, two generic mana floating, we can make infinite mana with Basalt Monolith, and once we have infinite mana, use Thousand Year Elixir to untap Oswald Fiddlebender. Do note, this is an outcome that relies on us having other artifacts to get the job done. In this instance, a 0CMC artifact or a 2CMC artifact, but we do give ourselves the 2CMC artifacts to break when we're going through this line of play. So it's always accessible. A play line is always accessible when you're going for this uh, doubling effect with Rings of Bright Hearth in play. But say we don't have Rings of Bright Hearth in play, how can we still accomplish a win with a Basalt line? With Basalt Monolith in play, one 1 CMC artifact, three white, and four generic mana, we'll use Oswald to break that 1 CMC artifact, get Mage Rite Stone, we'll tap the Mage Rite Stone to untap Oswald, and we'll use Oswald once again, breaking either Mage Rite Stone or any other 2 CMC rock to find Rings of Bright Hearth. Now this combo line only generates infinite mana, so you'll need the Staff of Domination in hand, or the Thousand Year Elixir, or the Sensei's Divining Top, 
and or in some instances the voltaic key will be fine or you can just have the walking ballista in hand but do note with infinite mana you still have a way to get to a win provided you have an outlet in your hand now the next line of play i want to discuss is with mystic forge with and without a doubler so let's just say in this instance we have illusionist bracers equipped to Oswald Fiddlebender. If you have Sensei's Divining Top on the field, along with another one CMC artifact, and three white, we can tap Oswald to get Majorite Stone and Grim Monolith. We'll tap Grim Monolith here to generate three generic mana to not only pay for the Majorite Stone, but to pay for what's coming. We'll use Oswald and break Grim Monolith to get Thousand Year Elixir and Cloud Key. With the two generic mana floating, we'll use that to pay for Thousand Year Elixir's cost, untapping our boy Oswald Fiddlebender. We'll now Fiddlebend once more, breaking any three CMC artifact, or in this instance, just the Thousand Year Elixir, to get Mystical Forge. And wham bam, thank you ma'am, we have our three cards in play to draw through the deck. And again, this is one of the more convoluted play lines because at 1 CMC, Sensei's Divining Top, at 3 CMC, Cloud Key, at 4 CMC, our Mystic Forge. It's difficult to fiddle bend all these things into existence and does require, at least in this particular scenario, our Sensei's Divining Top in play. So I wouldn't really shoot for this unless I had Sensei's in my starting hand or I've played it onto the battlefield from a previous turn. But it's very simple to set up, provided we have our Illusionist Bracers, and obviously you can add to this equation some generic mana if you want to use Rings of Bright Hearth instead, or if you just happen to have Rings of Bright Hearth. But what if you don't have a doubler on the field and still want to shoot for the Mystic Line of Play? It's still doable. In this instance, you will need Sensei's Divining Top and Cloud Key on the field. Another one CMC artifact, three white, and two generic mana. We'll use Oswald to gain Mage Rite Stone, and Mage Rite Stone to gain Thousand Year Elixir, and Thousand Year Elixir to go into Mystic Forge. These playlines are seeming very familiar, and that's because we're using a lot of the same cards to accomplish a win. These untappers are absolutely integral to the strategy, and I would love to see more in the future, but as it stands now, Mage Rite Stone, Thousand Year Elixir, positively enough to get the job done. And although these play lines are very proactive and snappy and can shoot for a win immediately, these aren't always advisable to shoot for. Perhaps it's better to just go for Mage Rite Stone, use Mage Rite Stone to untap Oswald, to break a separate 2CMC artifact to get Trini Sphere down instead, and slow the pace of the game if you feel like someone might have interaction for you. This is a good way to set up your defense before going for the play line, because all of our turns, all of our actions, they need to be deliberate, they need to be well thought and well timed. So. Even though I'm showing you play lines that are accessible, that doesn't mean you should always shoot for these play lines immediately. And again, these will vary depending on what's in your hand, what's in your graveyard, and what's on the battlefield. But let's talk about the Masticor line of play with and without a doubler. So for this instance, let's just use Illusionist Bracers again in this example. In this instance, we'll need two 1CMC artifacts, three white, and two generic. We'll break one of those 1CMC artifacts to find Mage Rite Stone and Metallic Mimic. Mimic will enter saying Masticor. We'll utilize Mage Rite Stone to untap Oswald, breaking it to find Blasting Station and Thousand Year Elixir. This time around, we'll use Thousand Year Elixir to untap Oswald, breaking that secondary 1CMC artifact to find Lesser Masticor and let's just say Fear of Resistance. And now we have our Lesser Masticor, our Metallic Mimic on Masticor, and Blasting Station ready and raring to damage out the board. But what if we don't have our doubler out? Can we still accomplish this play line? The answer is yes. With Metallic Mimic and an Untapper on the field, along with a 1CMC artifact and two white and one generic mana, we can shoot for the Lesser Masticor by breaking that 1CMC artifact, use the Untapper to untap Master Fiddlebender, and in this instance break the Lesser Masticor, getting Blasting Station, and Persist will bring it back to set off our play line. This variation also very clean, and you'll notice it requires less mana on our part to get the job done, so a little setup goes a long way with accomplishing our combo lines in this deck. Again, these pods require a lot of moving parts, so sometimes it's better to set up our board state before shooting for them, and that's why I say this is more of a mid-range strategy, unless you're able to throw down the rings of Bright Hearth or Illusionist uh, Bracers early, sometimes it's better to just set up the board for ourselves instead. 
Now, the last play line I want to illustrate is rather simple, and that's with Dranath Magistrate. Now, outside of having Dranath Magistrate in your starting hand, which is always great, what do we do if we need to shoot for him and he's somewhere in our deck? With Esper Sentinel in play, another card we should be prioritizing at one white artifact creature human soldier, an untapper, one one CMC artifact and one three CMC artifact with two white and three generic. We can shoot for Pyre of Heroes by breaking that one CMC artifact and it reads for two generic artifact, pay to sacrifice a creature, search your library for a creature card that shares a creature type with the sacrificed creature. Well, Esper Sentinel is a human and Dranath Magistrate is a human, a pod within a pod. And after we pod out our Dranath Magistrate, we'll go ahead and use the untapper to untap Oswald, break that three CMC artifact and find Ubermask. The Ubermask line of play is phenomenal. And if you can get this out early, you will shut down the board and easily win out over your opponents, provided they can't cast anything. So definitely shoot for it if you can, but similarly to our Sensei's Divining Top, Cloud Key, and Mystic Forge line of play, it's not the easiest to get to because unfortunately Dranath Magistrate isn't an artifact. But again, you will be prioritizing Esper Sentinel in those early stages to get a few draws in. So if you do do that, note that you have Dranath accessible via Pyre of Heroes. Now whether or not that play line stays in existence in this list will be questionable as we see new sets and time will tell if Pyre into Dranath is worth it. But with Ubermask, I think it certainly is. And I've been able to get that combo down on turn two, which is absolutely absurd. Uh, turn three more often times than not, but on turn three, having him locked out, hopefully we've seen all the bounce and removal we would have at that point in a CDH setting you're going to be in a really great spot, provided there isn't a dark confidant or a dark tutelage or someone hasn't gone off with their ad nauseum at this point, then you will be able to lock players down. Now, there are just a handful of cards I want to discuss before we close this video out. I hope those play lines were illustrated well enough for you to see some of the synergies that exist in this list. Again, there are hundreds of ways to accomplish the same tasks I've showed you, but they do like and use and manipulate those untappers and our doublers. But so far as our land count is concerned, there's 29 lands in the list and they're all very valuable to us because we need white mana to do things. And if you happen to be shy of lands, Mycosynth, Wellspring, and Archaeomancer's map are so good for this deck. At two generic artifact, when Mycosynth Wellspring enters the battlefield or is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. This is a great way to play into our Thousand Year Elixir and or our Trini Sphere and get some planes to throw down so that we can fiddle bend another day. And much like that, we have our Kaomancer's map that actually gets us the two lands instantaneously. For two generic, one white artifact, when Archaeomancer's map enters the battlefield, search your library for up to two basic planes, reveal them and put them into your hand and shuffle your library. When a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, if that player controls more lands than you, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. And this is actually really good because we have Ancient Den and Darksteel Citadel and we'll oftentimes break those for our Esper Sentinel or break them for our Soul Ring. And that is gonna put us down a land. And this is the one instance where white being behind in the game is actually a good thing because we will actively put ourselves behind by breaking uh, our artifacts and our lands in this instance. So our Kaomancer's map will trigger in your games. It's actually really good if you miss land drops too. This is gonna give you an opportunity to get back on track with everyone else's land base. Now, beyond those, you'll notice that White has some recovery tools, but there are two that I highly recommend you play in your list, and those two are Conjurer's Bobble and Scrap Trawler. Conjurer's Bobble for one generic artifact, tap it, sacrifice Conjurer's Bobble, put up to one target card from your graveyard on the bottom of your library and draw a card. So not only does it replace itself, it gives you the opportunity to fiddle bend something that was destroyed by one of your opponents by placing it right back in your deck to find. This is a really great way to recover artifacts. And if you just want to put them back in your hand, Scrap Trawler has three generic artifact creature construct, three, two body. Whatever Scrap Trawler or another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield return to your hand target artifact card in your graveyard with lesser mana value. This card is really excellent for, I found, setting up the Mystic Forge line of play because oftentimes I'll utilize Sensei's Dividing Top for the card quality of scrying three, scrying three, 
but I'll oftentimes fiddle bend it away into my graveyard. And that's okay because if I go for a scrap trawler, I can get Sensei's Divining Top right back in my hand to shoot for the Cloud Key Mystic Forge Sensei's line of play. It's okay that it's in our graveyard because we do have this means of recovery as well as an Argivian find in the list and maybe we add more in the future. But I found that these two artifacts are enough because again, we're playing very deliberately. If we know we need something, we shoot for it with Oswald and we'll be safe. Now, the last card I want to talk about, the last two cards, that is, are simple draw utilities. But you'll notice how important our one drops were in those play lines I've illustrated. Note that you can play into our play lines with zero CMC artifacts, but it's easier to get the ball rolling with our one drops. And we need every one drop we can find. So ones that replenish our hand are the best. And the two best I found are Chromatic Star and Arkham's Astrolabe. Chromatic Star at one generic artifact, pay one, tap it, sacrifice Chromatic Star, add one mana of any color. You'll never want to do this, you shouldn't need to filter in this list, but more importantly, if you were to break this with Oswald, when Chromatic Star is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, draw a card. And similarly, but on arrival, we have Arkham's Astrolabe at one snow mana. Snow artifact, when Arkham's Astrolabe enters the battlefield, draw a card. You can also filter colorless and make any colored mana by paying one and tapping it. Now, Arkham's Astrolabe and Chromatic Star are amazing. Chromatic Sphere, not so much. We want our artifacts to enter the battlefield or leave the battlefield and benefit us. We don't want to have to activate them and sacrifice them themselves to get some benefit because the benefit of a one drop in this list is that we can churn that into one of the play lines I've illustrated. So it's important that Arkham's Astrolabe is able to stay on the battlefield and benefit us by just being a 1CMC artifact, because that means Oswald can turn it into anything else. So, you know, the Urza's Bobble, the Mistress Bobble, all that nonsense, they're fun for other lists, but they're not good here. We want our one drops to play and stay so that we can convert them into something we need. That's how I see the artifacts in this list, at least the one zone of artifacts, because if you notice with all these play lines, we're really relying on our one drops to convert into meaningful plays. So the more one drops we can get, the better this deck will become. And I've hoped that I've illustrated this list well enough. It's again, a list that I've taken a lot of time on in developing and is only going to improve in time because all it needs are more artifacts and we get artifacts every single set. So this list is only going to grow in time and I cannot wait to play it on the show and I hope that you enjoy playing it with your playgroup at home or your local game store. But as I do with every video, I like to thank one random Patreon member and today's random member is John Breath. John has been a brew baby since September of last year. Thank you, John, for being such a long-standing member of the Brew Baby crew. You are among the best. And concerning the monthly topic, I turn to Noah Murtha. A friend got me into the game as a fun time with friends that quickly became competitive for the two of us. I quite enjoy solving problems and puzzles, and that's exactly what MTG is to me. A puzzle that I'm constantly trying to solve. However, I don't think I'll ever solve it completely which is why I keep coming back over and over, day after day. Magic got me through a rough time in my life as well. So while I know it's a game, it's also much more than that to me. Thank you, Noah, for sharing your thoughts on the monthly topic, and I can't wait to read your thoughts in the comments down below. But guys, I hope you enjoyed this deck tech. Feel free to ask me any questions on Oswald. I know it's a very complex and sometimes convoluted list to play out, but it's an extremely enjoyable one, and honestly, the best mono white has to offer at this time. I've actually converted Teshar into Oswald. For those of you who are staying till the end of this video, I've actually converted my Teshar list into Oswald. I, it's just so enjoyable to problem solve, as Noah stated. It's a puzzle in and of itself, a game in and of itself, and so deliberate and so thoughtful that uh, it's just the kind of thing I like doing. But do note, I will still update Teshar as new sets come out. So don't worry if you're a Teshar loyalist and follow my list, but also follow Oswald if you want to fiddle bend like I do. Again, my name is Patrick Marlette, and happy brewing, babies!